Memory is such an intriguing yet troubling part of cognitive psychology and everyday life. For whatever reason, we use our ability to remember things as a shorthand measure for judging our general cognitive abilities. And yet, chances are a huge amount of what we remember never happened. Not that we'd ever realise. Where we lack in memory, we more than make up for in the skill of self-deception. So what's the story of our cheeky, less than reliable memory? After all, I thought long-term memory is supposed to be unlimited and last for a lifetime. Well, it turns out things might be a tad more complicated than that. The fallibility of human memory is nothing new. Back in 1895, Hermann Ebbinghaus used himself as the participant in a study on how long he could remember a list of 13 nonsense syllables. Wex, pib, dep, and the like. Ebbinghaus, a man with one too many hobbies, would assess how long it took him to relearn the list after various lengths of time, ranging from a couple of minutes to 31 days. And what he found was that his ability to recall the list of nonsense syllables nosedived fairly quickly over the period of one or two days. But even after a whole month, he was still able to recall some information from his list. So what can we learn from Ebbinghaus' efforts to keep himself entertained, apart from that he needed to get out more? Well, it's that our memories aren't absolute. Let's add some context with a couple of more recent studies. Barrick et al. in 1975 wanted to find out what graduates could remember of their classmates as time passed after graduating. The researchers asked participants to free recall who they graduated alongside and also provided participants with photos to match up with names. Whilst the ability to recognise names and faces of former classmates remained pretty high for 15 years after graduating, as the retention interval increased, participants' recall abilities lessened. In 1984, Barrett conducted a similar experiment, this time considering people's ability to remember the Spanish that they'd learned at school. Barrick and his fellow researchers found that the recall decreased over the first six years after graduation before steadying for the next 35 years and then decreasing thereafter. Barrick attributes this period of consistent recallability to a perma store, something that he suggests demonstrates deep learning of the original information, whether that's information about former classmates or useful Spanish phrases. But Nisa has another idea suggesting that people have a schematic representation of a knowledge domain. To put this another way, we don't know something or other, we know about something or other. Specific knowledge may not be permanently available to us, but our cognitive systems of representation, such as schema, allow us to retrieve information that matches our conceptual expectations. Conceptual knowledge, the general gist, should therefore be better retained than straightforward facts like names and dates. Conway et al. support this notion by assessing students' abilities to remember information learned in a cognitive psychology course. The longitudinal study lasted 12 years, and the researchers found that memory declined over the first three years and then stabilised, similar to the pattern of loss and stabilisation noted by Barrick and those Spanish students. However, Conway et al. additionally note that the recall of proper names declined more rapidly than did memory for concepts. So if we recall the conceptual gist better than the explicit details, how do we know whether we're remembering the details accurately? Well, we're probably not. Which is why Bartlett in 1934 challenged the concept of memory being a recollection at all. From his experience of people plugging the gaps in their memories with whatever made the most sense to them, Bartlett goes as far as to suggest that memories are creative reconstructions of what happened. Sometimes even total constructions of what the individual thinks should have happened. And so often without the person realising that they are recalling a false memory. In a brilliantly simple experiment at the beginning of this century, Rodiger et al. showed participants short videos of typical household scenarios. Each participant took part in the experiment with another person, who was actually a confederate of the researchers. 
So after the 15 or 60 second video, the two participants were asked to collaboratively build a list of household items that they saw in the video. In half of the scenes, the Confederate provided household objects that weren't in the scene, but would have made contextual sense. After a short delay, the real participant was privately asked to recall the household objects seen in the video clip. Those participants who had been paired with a confederate who listed incorrect items in the collaborative condition were significantly more likely to recall items that were not featured in the original clip. This was even more noticeable for participants who had seen a 15 second clip instead of a 60 second clip. The startling thing about these false recollections is how sure the participants were that they had seen the objects that they never saw. Ironically, participants were significantly more likely to say that they knew an item was in the scene rather than that they remembered seeing it. This knowledge seems rooted in our reliance on context over detail, something that Johnson et al put down to the fact that we receive information from so many different sources all the time. And so whilst we may recall an individual scrap of information, we might misattribute it to a different source. Johnson refers to this as our source monitoring framework. And it may explain why participants in Rodiger's study were so easily misled by the Confederate planting false memories in their heads. All this goes to show that our memories of information and events can be very easily manipulated and often without our being any the wiser. What does this mean in practice? Trust in your ability to remember the gist of something much more than the details. And if you ever think you really, truly, completely know something for sure, don't be so sure. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something about your memory. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and share it with a friend. And if you've got any thoughts, I'd love to hear them in the comment section below. If you haven't done so already, remember to subscribe to Psychology Unlocked and that way you won't miss another video. Look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.